most people wouldn't associate the mandolin with the blues. So what made you put the two of these together? Well, let's see, when I was uh, much younger, I was playing blues guitar. I still do now. But I started out as a rock and roll guitar player and, and was turned on to the blues and uh, learned about the blues and got hooked on blues. And uh, I was recommended by a friend to, listen, since I played mandolin, at the time I was playing Celtic mandolin, and they said, you should, uh, have you heard of Johnny Young? Johnny Young was a blues man in Chicago who played guitar and sang, but he also played mandolin. And when I heard his recordings of playing mandolin with Otis Spann playing piano, I fell in love with it immediately and said, I've got to do that with the mandolin. Well, since then, I've learned that the mandolin has been in the African-American community uh, in the hands of blues people since the blues began. In fact, uh, W.C. Handy, who uh, is considered uh, as the father of the blues, when he first wrote about the music that he heard as blues, was by listening to a trio in Mississippi that had a guitar player, a mandolin player, and a bass. Because mandolins were big in the, in the States in the 20s, and uh, everybody, city, country, uh, white or black, everybody was uh, playing mandolins. There were mandolins everywhere. Um, it was a big, a big instrument. And so there's a huge body of recordings of, of different mandolin players that played in what we would call the blues style. And so I, so I just pursued it and have been writing about it ever since. That's interesting because there was some... Um... In that era, talking about the 20s and the 30s, I mean, the man, I, I didn't realize the mandolin was so popular. I know the, the ukulele is popular and the banjo and that sort of thing, but you you don't hear so much about the mandolin. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, well, <laughs> no, you know, it's, uh, well, let, let me put it this way. The first popular music act to play at Kern and A.D. Hall was, um, now what was his name? Uh, 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 reach, uh, Europe, James Europe and his Trouble Club Orchestra, which was, uh, I, I forget the numbers, but only yeah. 100 mandolins. It was a mandolin <laughs> orchestra. <laughs> that was the first popular music act to play. Uh, James Reese Europe, uh, first popular music uh, act to play at Carnegie Hall. There were mandolin orchestras in every city. Uh, women were using mandolin cases, the old Neapolitan mandolin cases for purses and decorating them and, and uh, buying them as purses. And you can tell that there were a lot of mandolins because many of those mandolins survive today. Uh, those uh, uh, old Gibsons and Neapolitan mandolins and Martins and Lyman and Ely. Um, there was a, it was a very, it was considered the rage instrument of the time. Wow. Well, that's interesting because, um, so it has a whole history which is kind of not, you know, not generally, uh, Appreciated. Have you? I know you're a writer too. For uh, have you written anything about mandolin history? I, I wrote a book uh, specifically to the blues mandolin and the history of it, and it's called Mandolin Blues from Memphis to Maxwell Street, and it's on uh, Hal Leonard is the publisher, oh. uh, and it's a music instruction, but it also has lots of stories. Yeah. I, I happen to be blessed in my time to work with great musicians who were from that era. Uh, Yank Rachel started recording in the 20s and I caught up with him in the, in the 80s and was able to write about him and, and work with him. And then Howard Armstrong, people referred to as Louie Bluey, was his stage name. Martin Bogan and Armstrong were the last of the black string bands from that era and he survived well into the new century and he was a close friend and, and we spent a lot of time together and playing together and they, they gave me windows on this whole thing you know that uh, that there were and they you know they told me there are a lot of people out there that were in the day playing mandolin but nobody knew about it because recording what we know about the world is according to what recording artists or recording companies decided to sell us. I mean, that you know, if they didn't think the music was going to make a hit, they didn't. So there were a lot of musicians that we'll never know about their music. Now, it's, uh, you know, I know that the mandolin became big because of Bill Monroe and, and, and the bluegrass, but I, I've been hired to teach uh, at programs where I, where I, I do one workshop, which is 
mm-hmm. was listening to blues people. And there are blues, uh, you know, string band performers that he listened to, and, and it inspired him. Now he created a unique style, but there's a lot of blues in it. Maybe you could uh, briefly tell us a little, just a little about yourself, where you came from, where you grew up, and how you got interested in 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 music and in the blues. And, and I grew up in Detroit, and uh, my family is Italian. You know, I. I loved uh, the traditional Italian music and I heard mandolin music and I rejected all of that and wanted to be a rock and roller. But on a family trip when I graduated from high school we all went to Italy to visit my family and I wanted a souvenir so I found the mandolin in a shop and I thought that'd be cool on that's at least close to it. Mm-hmm. And it, I can transport it on the plane. So I brought it home and, and I tried to learn it and not the proper way, but uh, you know, just tuning open strings, and I, you know, I was playing around with it, noodling with it. And a friend of mine said, "Man, you should just learn how to really play it right." Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, I taught myself how to play uh, and read music on the mandolin because there's a whole body of fiddle tunes uh, and classical music that's all available if you can read it, and um, that opened my eyes to all of that. And so I, I really got hooked on the mandolin. Uh, like I said before, once I discovered Johnny Young was playing blues, then my whole direction, the whole direction of my musical life just went upside down and I became uh, totally focused on mandolin. I, I still play guitar and I teach guitar. Uh, and blues, blues guitar styles, I can still do that. But um, I really, I don't know, I could say most of my time is spent in uh, researching, studying, writing, playing, creating uh, music in the blues uh, for the mandolin. Uh, I, I had moved to LA for a while and now I live in Houston, Texas, but uh, you know, the locations didn't affect anything about what I was doing. You know, it's just, uh, I just maintained uh, my focus on, on my life there. So, have you played Mariposa before? No, I haven't, but I did attend Mariposa in its early years when the festival was on the island. And as a young young man, it was it was the first music festival that I ever went to, and I was just blown away by the diversity of the acts. And I also had a chance to see uh, and meet blues acts that I had been listening to, you know, people that I've uh, read about and studied. The Yank Rachel was there, uh, Howard Armstrong, or Louis Bluey, and mm. the band, Martin Bogan and the Armstrongs, I fell in love with them there. John Hammond, uh, Buck of White, there were some great performers, and I never forgot it. I mean, it, it really, really got me started as a, as a musician. Mm-hmm. I mean, I... I was going to college studying to be a biologist. I ended up teaching science uh, as a day job, but that festival really kicked my butt. I, thought, I walked away from it going, I want to do that. You know, I want to do stuff like that. So when this opportunity to work my poser came up, it just uh, lit me up. I mean, it's like, uh, uh, it's a very special thing for me, you know, for me, for me to get this opportunity. I feel like I've come full circle. Mm-hmm. I can't wait to be there. I'm really looking forward to it.